what would you consider a good deal? What's something that you are delighted to put your heart, your energy, your resources into? There have been a lot of things over the course of my life that I thought was a good investment. One of the first was Rogaine, hair replacement therapy. <laughs> now, when you go bald at 22, you can be convinced to invest your time and your money into anything that might restore your hairstyle because it's very valuable to you at 22. Unfortunately, it turned out that this was a bad investment. It was a lot of money, and nothing happened at all. I just looked really silly wearing mousse on my head for a couple of minutes a day. But that wasn't the only thing that I invested my time into. I have also invested my time and my energy into an electronic ab belt. Now, if you don't know what this is, an electronic ab belt is for the lazy among us who want to lose weight without actually working out. And so what you do is you take a belt that stimulates the uh, muscles in your abdomen, and you basically just sit down, and while you're eating a bowl of ice cream, <laughs> it just does its thing. Now, I invested in this because I thought, what could be better than losing weight without having to exercise? I'll tell you what's not better, being electrocuted in the stomach. <laughs> That's not better than exercise. So if there are any of you who are tempted uh, and... Uh, tempted to be dissuaded by this, this device, then don't do it. Don't do it. Um, so there are a lot of things in our life. We could go down the list. We could keep going. And there's not only things and items out there in the world that we invest our time and our energy into. It's relationships as well. We invest ourselves into marriages. We invest ourselves into friendships. We invest ourselves wherever there are people. And when we do that, we pour something of ourselves and our heart into those things because we ultimately think that it's a good deal, because we think that it's worth it. And as we come to today's scripture passage, and we continue to read the story of Ruth, we come to a moment in the life of Boaz in which he makes known to us what he thinks is worth it, what he thinks is worth the investment of his energy and his resources. And ultimately, I think we're going to learn a lesson from Boaz this morning. And the lesson is this, that godliness can be an inconvenience, but it will lead us to the love of God. True godliness can be an inconvenience, but investing in it can lead us to the love of God. Now, to catch you up, if you have missed any of our series of Ruth, we have been following the story of two women primarily, Ruth and Naomi. And both of these women have came out of terrible tragedy. Naomi having lost her husband and her two sons, and Ruth having lost her husband, Malon. And these two women travel back to Naomi's hometown of Bethlehem, trying to figure out what's next for them. And as they arrive in Bethlehem, through the providence of God, they arrive in the field of a man named Boaz. Boaz cares deeply for these women. He provides for them. He makes a way for Ruth to glean and to provide for their family. And ultimately, it's revealed to us that this man, whom they just so happened to have ended in the field of, is their kinsman redeemer. He is the man that can redeem their family and restore what they've lost. And so last week, we looked at a conversation that happened between Boaz and Ruth. Ruth was encouraged by Naomi to go and speak with Boaz and to make known that he, they wanted him to be their redeemer. So that's what Ruth does. She goes in secret, in the night, appears before Boaz and asks him to marry her, to redeem their family. And Boaz is just as thrilled to be asked as Ruth is to ask. Boaz would be delighted to do so, but first, he needs to settle something. Because as it turns out, Boaz knows something that Ruth and Naomi didn't. He knows that there is someone ahead of him who really is the Redeemer. Someone who has legal right to redeem them both. And so, we're going to find out what Boaz does to remedy that situation. What is going to happen next, now that we know that there is someone else in line? And as we enter chapter 4, we're going to see three things that teach us about Ruth's redemption. First of all, we're going to see a righteous man. The second thing we will see is an inconvenient price. And thirdly, we will see a blessed redeemer. So let's dive straight in this morning to take a look at this. The first thing that we see is a righteous man. Not too long ago in New Jersey, there was an armored truck carrying some money away from a bank in various uh, retail facilities. And as it was on Interstate 70, the driver's vehicle came to a stop. 
And as he came to a stop, the door swung open and caused $600,000 in bundles and in loose bills to fall out all over the interstate during rush hour. There was an, uh, a whole uh, kind of moment of chaos there on the road as cars swerved to miss it and stopped. There was a couple of accidents, but that wasn't the worst. I'm sure you can imagine what happened next when people realized what was blowing around on the interstate in front of them. Drivers started pulling over, getting out of their cars to grab as much of this cash as they possibly could. There were hundreds and thousands of dollars around them. People were stuffing it in their pockets, getting into their cars and driving off. Because after all, who is going to be able to identify them? Who is going to be able to track them down? It's chaos. One of the witnesses from the scene said that the driver of the armored truck looked like he was laughing and crying at the same time. He was watching all this blow away in the insanity of the moment. Now, not everyone chose to do what those people did. Not everyone grabbed the cash and then drove away. Some of the people on the scene were good Samaritans. They chose to gather the cash together and bring it to the driver of the armored truck. Some people even brought it to the police station after the event to have it returned. My question for you this morning is which kind of person would you be? If you were traveling down in the state 88 and an armored truck in front of you blew open and cash fell everywhere all over the interstate, would you be person A who decides to seize that opportunity and grab some cash? Or would you be the kind of person who gathers it together and hands it in? Is doing the right thing important to you even when you have the opportunity to get away with it and get something that benefits you? Here's how Boaz's efforts to redeem Ruth begin in chapter 4. In Ruth 4, verses 1 through 4, it says this, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. See, Boaz values God's law so much that even though he deeply, deeply loves Ruth and wants to redeem her family, he knows that there is someone else who has a right to it first. There's someone else who gets to be that person legally. He's willing to inconvenience himself to make sure that Ruth's family is redeemed. And it's an inconvenience because we already know that Boaz loves Ruth and wants to redeem her, but he is willing to put his opportunity to do that on the line so that the person who deserves the opportunity gets it fast. Godliness can be an inconvenience, but it will lead us to the love of God. Doing what he does in this moment is an inconvenient thing, because even though Ruth will still get her redeemer, Boaz won't get to be that redeemer. You see, immediately after his discussion with Ruth the previous night, Boaz traveled into the city, very early that morning, very likely. Travels to a place that looks a little bit like this. This is the city gate. And in these days and in this culture, this was as close to what we would consider a civil court. This is where matters of the family would be disputed and resolved. That's why Boaz gathers the elders of the city together there. Boaz comes here because he is here to make a deal. He is here to figure out this situation for Ruth and Naomi. Boaz went to the trouble of gathering the elders, gathering everyone that was required to make a verdict ahead of time so that when this man arrives, all that needs to happen is a conversation. Clearly, Boaz is very motivated. Again, that tells us how much he dearly loves Ruth and Naomi. Because he didn't sit on this. He didn't wait on this. Immediately after his conversation with Ruth, Boaz sets out to make sure things are set right for their family. 
When the Yudhman arrives and Boaz explains the situation to him, tells him of the family and of the sale of the land, we are perhaps discouraged a little to hear that this redeemer, this other kinsman says, I will redeem it. Now I say discouraged not because we don't want Ruth and Naomi to be redeemed. I say discouraged because we want Boaz to be the redeemer. As we've traveled through this story and we've seen what this man has done for this family, I think we'd all agree that we want Boaz to be the person that sets this right. Yet with those words, this other kinsman has taken away the opportunity for Boaz to do it. I will redeem it. In this moment, it seems that things have not gone the way that we, or Ruth, wanted them to go. And what's ironic about it is that that has happened because Boaz has chosen to be righteous. He's chosen to do what is right in the eyes of God. Here's what I think that this really is in this moment is that Boaz very deeply loves Ruth, but he loves God more. Boaz really loves Ruth, but God is his priority. And sometimes that kind of godliness can be very inconvenient to our own desires. Placing God as the priority can be inconvenient to our own desires. But God is looking for men and women who don't cut corners. God is looking for men and women whose hearts are fully his, we're told in the book of Second Chronicles. God is looking for men and women like Boaz, who are willing to put their desires after God's. Because that's who Boaz was. He loved God so deeply, he valued God's law so deeply, that it was more important to him that he do the right thing than he, that he gets what he wants. We live in a culture, I think, that is very impulsive, too driven sometimes by emotion. And I think we all fight for the things that we want. But church, Jesus asks of us that we would be the kind of people like Boaz who are willing to be patient, slow to act, and think about what the right thing is to do. To be the kind of people who ask of God, what is it that you ask of me? How should I love my neighbors? Because godliness can be an inconvenience, but it leads us to the love of God. Did you know that the most loving thing that we as people can do for others is to love God first? Love God more than we love them. That seems a strange thing to say, isn't it? That the, the way to love someone is to love someone else more. But the truth is, I will be a better husband, I will be a better father, I will be a better brother, and I will be a better friend when God is what is most important in my life. Because Boaz's love for God is driving him to put his own needs behind the needs of other people around him. It's driving him to put his needs behind Ruth's needs. It's driving him to put his needs behind the needs of the other redeemer. Because Boaz loves God, he is loving God his community, and the people around him better than if he loved them the most. Better than if his desires were at the forefront. The question then is, will this new kinsman follow in the example of Boaz? Is this new character, this new person who is now going to redeem Ruth, going to be the same kind of person that Boaz is? The second thing that we're going to see is an inconvenient price. Those of you who are parents of small children know how quickly as a parent you have to learn to make bargains with your kids if you want them to do the right thing. If you eat your vegetables, Jonathan, you get to have some candy afterwards. If you clean up your room, then maybe we can go to the playground later. We have to make these deals to get our kids to do the things that we want sometimes. Now, Janine and I have reached a new point in parenting which goes one step even beyond that, because now we don't just need to make deals with our kids sometimes, it has to be a really convenient deal as well. For example, sometimes we're with Jonathan and we're saying, hey, well, hey, buddy, we need to do some things on the inside, we need to tidy the house, clean up the toys, and then maybe we can go play outside. And Jonathan's reply is, well, I, I want to play outside right now, though. I don't want to play outside later. I want to play outside right now. So this isn't convenient for me, Dad, we need to have a deal that's convenient for me right now. 
right? And this goes on and on. I think that this kind of attitude goes on even sometimes into adulthood. And we throw ourselves only into the things that are most convenient for us, the things that are easiest for us, the things that don't risk our comfort and our security and the dreams that we have for ourselves. As we continue to read Ruth, it says in verse 5, Boaz said, The day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. What happens here is that with the revelation of one detail, this Redeemer goes from being willing to do it to saying, I can't do that. I can't redeem this family any longer. It turns out godliness was too inconvenient for this kinsman. See, what happens is Boaz makes clear that Ruth and the land are a package deal. Initially, when Boaz lays out the situation, he mentions that Elimelech's land needs to be redeemed. But now what he says after the man says that he'll redeem it is Boaz quite cleverly makes known that that's not the only thing that needs to happen. You see, Elimelech had a widow. That widow has a daughter-in-law who has no husband and therefore can bring no new heirs into the family. She needs to be redeemed as well. So this land is a package deal with Ruth. And what the kinsman said is, well, I'm in for the land I'm not in for the Moabite. I'm not in for that woman. And here is his justification. See, he gives his justification that it would impair his own inheritance. See, in those days, inheritance was distributed amongst the children in the family, much as it is today, but with one difference. The firstborn of the family was going to be given a majority. Whoever was the firstborn son in the family was, was going to get a much larger share, up to two-thirds of what his brother or sister might get. Certainly his brother. So if this man marries Ruth, and they then have a child, what's going to happen is that this man's inheritance is going to be diluted. It's going to be filtered down, because the more children you have, the more your estate gets fractioned up. The less that the firstborn is going to start out with, because he's going to have to share it, with more siblings. So what this man is saying is, if I marry Ruth and I do perpetuate the name of the dead, if I provide her with an heir for Elimelech's family, well then my own estate is in jeopardy. But that's not the only thing that he means when he says it would impair his own inheritance. You see, when he initially agrees to this, he's doing so because he's going to get the land that belonged to Elimelech's family. It's going to enter into his estate. But again, if he has an heir with Ruth, then that heir would be the rightful heir to everything that once belonged to Elimelech. So even though he redeems the land and it becomes part of his estate, eventually he won't even get to split it amongst his own family because the estate in full would have to return to the heir of Elimelech. So now it's impairing his inheritance, not only because he would have to fraction out his own estate, but he wouldn't even get to keep this land that he's redeeming. In short, this deal becomes clear to the kinsman, and he realizes that it's inconvenient. That to redeem this woman is going to cost him. So he forfeits his right to redeem the land, and he gives the opportunity back to Boaz. May I ask you this morning, has there ever been a time that you have felt that God was asking too much of you? that perhaps God was asking you to do something that didn't immediately bring blessing and benefit to you and yours. I have felt that way and I have wrestled with parts of my faith because of it, because I didn't see the immediate benefit in doing the things that God has laid out before me. It might even hurt me to do them. It might cost me something. Lord, I want to be generous, but come on, I don't have a lot to give here. I don't have a lot of money. If you ask of me that I give this, I'm not going to have the same amount for my family and my kids and the ones that I love. 
This might hurt me. Lord, I want to love my enemies, but if I do that, if I forgive them, if I throw grace their way, then they may use that as an opportunity to walk all over me. If I give myself to my enemies and forgive them, it might end up costing me even more. Lord, I want to serve. I want to be available to do things and to serve in the community, but I want to make sure that it's something that I'm gifted at, that I'm comfortable with. Because otherwise, if you ask me to do something that I feel I don't fit with, it might end up draining me. I don't have a lot of time. So I want to make sure that I'm using that time in the ways that's most beneficial. These may not be the kind of things that you have said, but I assure you it's the kind of things that I have said. When God has presented me in my life with opportunities to love others, to forgive others, to be generous, to serve in sacrificial ways, there is a part of my heart that says, that's really inconvenient, God. There's other things going on in my life right now. I'm paying bills, I've got stress, I'm trying to be a good dad, I'm trying to be a good husband, I'm trying to do my job well, and you're asking something of me that risks my comfort and my security, and that's too inconvenient for me, God. I'm sorry to say that I see a lot of myself in this kinsman. There's always reasons to not do what God has asked of us. But do we really want to miss out on the invitations that God gives us to be a part of him building his kingdom in this world? Do we want to miss out on the opportunity to change the lives of people around us who are in desperate need of grace? Most importantly, do we want to miss out on an invitation to know God's love better for us by serving others and seeing that love being played out in front of us? I don't want to miss out on those opportunities. So that means I'm going to have to wrestle with the truth that although godliness can be inconvenient, it's going to lead me to the love of God. Now just as a matter of very brief interest, in the verses following this agreement between Boaz and this other kinsman, something very unusual happens that for time's sake we're not going to go into too much detail on. What happens is that the kinsman removes his sandal and he passes it to Boaz. And we're told in Scripture that that was a way of reflecting that a deal was being agreed upon. Now what isn't highlighted here in Ruth is that this is actually referring to a part of God's law in the book of Deuteronomy. You see, in the book of Deuteronomy where God lays out the instructions for a kinsman redeemer, for a family member who is to redeem uh, a widow, it said that if that redeemer refuses to redeem the widow, then the widow is entitled to take one of his sandals off, spit on him, and publicly shame him. The reason why is because this isn't an option for this man. He is the legal kinsman redeemer, and this isn't an opportunity, even though Boaz is really presenting him to, it that, that, to him that way. This is really an obligation that this man has to care for his family. God has asked this of the kinsman redeemer to make sure that widows are not left without care and protection, that families' estates are not lost because of death and tragedy. And what happens is that this man takes off his sandal, essentially saying, I know that I'm not fulfilling what God has asked me to do. And I know that the word of God, the law of God, says that when I do that, the widow is entitled to take my sandal and shame me. So I'm going to take my own sandal off. I'm going to pass it to you as a symbol before the elders, as a symbol before the community of Bethlehem here who know this story, and they can see I am not living up to what God has asked of me. See, this kinsman knows he is not doing the right thing. But thankfully, this meeting ends with some wonderful news because of a blessed redeemer. And that's the third thing that we see in this passage, a blessed redeemer. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought, the la- bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. 
You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. See, as soon as this other kinsman admits that he is not willing to do the right thing, that he admits that he is not willing to pay the inconvenient price of redeeming this family, Boaz loudly, clearly, and with incredible celebration says, I will. I will do it. He declares that he is going to make sure that Naomi's family line continues, that there is an heir to Elimelech, that they won't lose what was theirs. And then upon doing that, as he says that you are witnesses, you're seeing that I'm doing this, the elders and all the people at the city gate erupt and they pronounce a blessing over their family, particularly over Ruth. And it's almost as though the whole city of Bethlehem has been waiting for this moment for Boaz to finally redeem Ruth and Naomi. Maybe the story had passed out that people were aware of the Moabite woman who'd come with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and returned to Bethlehem. And they knew of their story, of the tragedy, of the heartbreak. Perhaps people knew of the kindness that Boaz had already shown them. Maybe they knew about this love story and they were rooting for them, hoping that it would turn out this way. I don't want to spoil what's coming in the final week of Ruth because it's very exciting, but I do want to point something out to you that it's very interesting that the blessing that the elders and the people of the city choose to pray over Boaz and his family is that their heir would be someone important. He compares Ruth, they pray for Ruth and compare to Rachel and Leah who were the literal mothers of the people of Israel. The mothers who gave birth to the tribes of Israel. And they pray that the one that would come from this family, the offspring, would be like the one that was born to Judah, the one that continued that family line. Again, hold on to that because we're going to see more of why they do that and why this is so significant. But at the very least, notice that they choose to do that even though Ruth, the woman he is marrying, was previously married for 10 years and had no heir meaning that most people would probably presume she's barren, that she couldn't have kids. Yet it's as if they seem to know that this story is going somewhere so far beyond Ruth and Boaz. There is celebration because this love, this choice, this action by Boaz is speaking to something beyond just this one story. See, as he does this, as he loves Ruth, So publicly, he paints a picture of what God's love is like. What a beautiful picture of God's love. A picture of how godliness can be inconvenient, but in the end it shows us the love of God. Boaz chooses out of love for God to do what is right, even though it's inconvenient, even though it will cause expense to himself because of his care and his love for Ruth and Naomi, and for God. And it results in this picture of God's love that's so wonderful, everyone around sees it. That's what happens when we live that way. That's what happens when we make godliness and loving God a priority in our lives. It will paint pictures to those around us of who God really is, of how much he cares for us, of how devoted to us he is. It's not simply that we as Christians get to wave some flag when we follow God's law and say, see, I'm a really good person. I did what God asked me to do. No, the true beauty of being a Christian, the true beauty of following God's law and pursuing godliness is that when we do it, other people will see how much God loves them. Other people will be welcomed into the family of faith and we'll get to rejoice together over how good our God is. And oh, if only the people present in this moment knew just how perfect a picture this actually was of God's love. 
Because one day, though this family doesn't know it, though this family can't foresee it, there was going to be someone else who would come long down in the future of the people of Israel. Another redeemer who would come for a bride who was lost in tragedy. Another redeemer who would come and at inconvenience to himself and at great expense to himself would lay down his life out of love to redeem his bride. We are that bride, and Jesus is our redeemer. We are the ones who, like Ruth, because of the tragedy of a broken world, have become lost and destitute. And Jesus, like Boaz, has come to us as a redeemer to say, I am willing to pay whatever price is necessary to redeem you. I am willing to be godly, to be righteous, to pursue what God's law requires so that I can redeem you. And just like the town elders, it's our job to celebrate and rejoice over that Redeemer. That when we see what Jesus does for people, the way that he loves his church and his bride, we like them should celebrate and pronounce blessing. We should get excited about that so that the world can see God's great love story. So that everyone around us can see who our God really is. Godliness can be an inconvenience, but investing in it will lead us to the love of God. As we close, I want to affirm to you that I know that this is true. I know that this is true because this is the story of my life. I stand before you excited about the Bible and a follower of Jesus because in my life I've been inconveniently loved. I stand as a follower of Jesus because I was inconveniently loved by a single mother who was trying to figure out how to raise a son all by herself. Who, when that son turned into a very difficult teenager, she stuck by me. She loved me. She supported me. She made space for me. She told me about Jesus. I stand before you this morning as a follower of Jesus because of a sister who inconveniently loved me. Because when I was failing out of school, she decided that she would take her evenings of her own life and her own time when she was married and spend that with me so that I wouldn't fail. Who loved me inconveniently by searching out adult male mentors for me because I was a young boy who didn't have any older men in my life and she wanted to find them for me because she wanted me to have role models I could follow role models who could show me Jesus and his love for me. Ultimately, friends, I am a follower of Jesus because I've been inconveniently loved by God himself, who when I gave him no reason to love me, loved me. And though it was terribly expensive for him to do so, he redeemed me with his own shed blood. This is the God that we follow. And this is the story that we want to repeat for eternity. This morning, dear friends, as we draw near to the final moments of Ruth's story, I urge you to remember that God has invested himself at your life, no matter the inconvenience. And that your pursuit of godliness would be motivated by the knowledge that that is what he has done for you. That it would be a celebration of God's endless, redemptive love for you. Would you pray with me as we close? Father, I thank you for this beautiful story of Ruth. We've been in a few weeks now, but as we go further and deeper into what you did in the lives of Boaz, Ruth, and Naomi, we continue to be amazed by how well you love us and how well you love others. God, may we be the righteous men and women as Boaz was who don't cut corners but seek to do what is right even when it is inconvenient. May we not be like the kinsmen who refuse to seize the opportunities you give us to love others because it is an inconvenience to us. And ultimately, may we celebrate the blessed Redeemer. May we be the ones who rejoice and sing and make known the story of the God who redeems his people at expense to himself. Lord, we love you and we need you and we pray this 
in your son's holy name. Amen.